Launched in late September and October 2018, the NVIDIA RTX series graphics cards have now been out for a year. At launch, NVIDIA heralded its groundbreaking new technologies, chief among them RTX and DLSS. It's time to look at the impact of this hardware release and see where we've ended up. At launch, NVIDIA showed off Shadow of the Tomb Raider, Metro Exodus, Assetto Corsa Competizione, Atomic Heart, and Battlefield 5. Shadow of the Tomb Raider added ray trace shadows, which at 1440p dropped the performance of an RTX 2080 Ti from 122 frames per second to a still very playable 87. That 28% drop didn't come with much of a visual wow factor though. It's a nice subtle effect adding to overall atmosphere, but it's unlikely many people bought the game for this feature alone. Metro Exodus added ray trace global illumination. Still subtle, but offers perhaps more of a visual upgrade over just shadows from light sources. Performance drops by a third here on the $1200 2080 Ti. Despite being shown at the launch, it was announced that the developers were not going forward with RTX for Assetto Corsa. Anatomic Heart has not yet been released. Battlefield 5, with its ray trace reflections, had likely the most impact and gained most attention. It was perhaps a rushed release, but received patches afterwards, improving performance. One important thing to note is Battlefield 5 isn't even using fully ray trace reflections. It's an extremely clever hybrid approach between ray tracing and screen space reflections. We can see this outlined in their GDC 2019 presentation. So of all of the launch titles that were actually released, we've got a bit of a mishmash of features here. Shadows, global illumination, or hybrid reflections, and all at reasonably low resolutions. A better example might be Control from Remedy. This turned out to be a graphical showcase. It supports RTX and looks amazing. As we've come to expect, that does come at a performance cost. A year post-launch, and it might be difficult to call RTX a raging success when it's possible to own more RTX-capable cards than you can own RTX-enabled games. High price, incremental performance difference over the previous generation, limited visual impact of RTX in most cases, and a high performance penalty in other cases. From the outset, I was critical of Nvidia's launch and their marketing. Tensor cores were leftovers from Volta's deep learning chips. AI inference is already fast on GPUs and there's very few use cases for it in games outside of a denoising post-processing step. Tensor cores have recently become useful for denoising renders in Blender. Terrific, but you're not selling many cards to gamers based on that. And no matter how many buzzwords you surround it with, upscaling is still just upscaling. It doesn't replace data that isn't there, and if you try, you're going to get some artifacting no matter what method you use. There's also a very heavy cost to training a model for DLSS. A traditional upscaling algorithm does have advantages in that it's faster, results are more deterministic, and there's no specialized hardware required. DLSS failed to provide much in the way of image quality improvements over regular upscaling, and was quickly improved upon by AMD's Fidelity FX sharpening. Reviews have said Control by Remedy has the best DLSS implementation so far, and that's certainly very true. There's one good reason why it's true, because they're not using NVIDIA's DLSS. Despite mentioning AI 15 times in NVIDIA's blog post, they come clean saying it's an image processing approach, which means it's not a machine learning model. Even though it's not at all DLSS, NVIDIA renamed this high performance GPU agnostic general approach DLSS. Perhaps in the hope that everyone would ignore the fact that the expensive AI cores are sitting idle. Mesh shading is a method of using compute hardware to cull your primitives before they hit the graphics pipeline. Groups of parallel running threads communicate via shared memory. Mesh shader workgroups are started. Each workgroup is responsible for writing out some geometry, a meshlet. In the Asteroids demo, Nvidia showed a scene where 350,000 asteroids were created with 10 million polygons each or 3.5 billion polygons in total. The mesh shader cut that down to a manageable 50 million. There's plenty of real world applications for this, obviously densely packed foliage in trees being a big one, complex debris and, and particle effects, and quite a lot of professional workloads. But a year later and nothing supports this. If that reminds you of the situation with AMD's primitive shader, then you're not the only one. When Vega was announced in early 2017, one of the key technologies was primitive shaders. Nobody used that either. It was never even exposed to developers. It was found that general compute shaders turned out to be just as effective without requiring any proprietary extensions. Things on this front may finally change with a DirectX 12 update supporting mesh shaders coming in the first half of next year. So DLSS has already been superseded. AI tensor cores have found little use outside of some professional workloads. 
Improvements to general rasterization performance and async compute have been really good, but that's not what the card was sold on. It was sold on the promise that it could do real-time ray tracing. We understand ray tracing and the computation required. It's not something that's been waiting for a hardware magic bullet to come along. No magic chips or special transistors. It's not something that had eluded everybody else in computing until Nvidia found it with a new gaming GPU. RT is a highly parallel compute problem. It's not something you just invent a core for. Ray tracing had already been around on non-RTX GPUs for some years. Well before Nvidia was pushing RTX Quake, we already had real-time path trace Quake on the GTX line and AMD GPU. Ray tracing wasn't something Nvidia was going to enable with their new lineup. It was something that was already coming. The question then is did Nvidia help drive this technology forward with the release of the RTX line? To ray trace a scene you need to create a data structure containing all of the triangles broken into groups. At each frame you test your rays against the intersecting points in that structure. It requires a huge number of memory accesses and this can be a limiting factor. So what did Nvidia actually do with Turing? A known bottleneck for BVH traversal is memory access. Turing cards come bundled with GDDR6 and a very pedestrian 448GB a second of bandwidth. If you want to add another 10 billion memory accesses per second, you're eating into precious bandwidth if latency doesn't get you first. Part of Nvidia's solution then was to form a cache for BVH data and keep related accesses local. Fixed function units scan the array, but that's not the magic. The secret source here is basically a cache. The fixed function units used to process that data aren't particularly special. The RT core scans the BVH data in its cache and returns a hit or no hit between the ray and the triangle. It's here where Nvidia derives their Giga Ray's number. When Nvidia says their RTX GPUs are 10 times faster on ray tracing, it's because they don't have to go to main memory to test the bounding box structure. This is a hugely important step. The more geometrically complex your scene, the more this matters. In professional renders with hundreds of millions of polygons, the speed up from RTX hardware can be 3 to 8 times. Once you have a hit, an intersection between the ray and an object, you need to shade it. And that's your standard shaders on the GPU. Raw teraflops still matter here. Always have, always will. As scene complexity drops, the relative shading work rises, and speed ups from RTX can drop to sub 10%. We've experienced speed ups of up to 7.5 in some scenarios, and less than 1.1 in others. RTX speeds will be lower in scenes where heavier shading relative to smaller geometry complexity and density. Games today do not use hundreds of millions of polygons, they generally use fewer than 10. Most games today probably use in the range of 2 or 3 million polygons per frame. If we scale up the scene complexity we get better results out of our RT cores, but we also put more load on the shaders which then becomes the bottleneck. Now, BVH construction, updating and searching can be done on CPUs or on general purpose GPUs. Very broadly speaking an RTX 2080 is 20 to 30 percent faster than a GTX 1080 in non-RT games. That's down to a 40 percent increase in memory bandwidth, most notable at higher resolutions, a 13 percent higher raw shader performance and async compute improvements. Now, ray tracing isn't only about scanning the BVH for intersections. Maybe you can speed up tenfold with local memory accesses, but you still need to feed the GPU, run your shaders, process post effects, and push those pixels out. That's alongside everything else a GPU might be doing, like streaming in textures or running simulations. A tiny little corner of your silicon happily iterating over some local data isn't also going to shade 49.7 million pixels for you each second. Now, let's for a moment imagine some other possible implementations. Imagine you have a BVH structure and you want to scan it using only the CPU. Thankfully, it's the 21st century, so you have a nice fat multi-core CPU. Each CPU, or thread, can process a volume in parallel. Much of the required data for that could sit in L2 or L3 cache. Now, some researchers have found near linear speedups when scaling BVH functions over multi-core CPUs. CPUs being very flexible in the algorithms you can run and how you partition your data, Modern CPUs also contain SIMID AVX instructions for parallel operations, similar to GPUs. And in fact, this is exactly what we see with Intel's Embrace system in the World of Tanks Ray Trace demo. Any CPU and any DX11 compatible GPU can run it. Features are very limited. It only works with shadows on undamaged tanks in direct sunlight, but it is a very early demo. 8 cores will be standard on even consoles, and PCs are seeing 10, 12, even 16 cores at the mainstream, with ever increasing cache sizes. Games today have tended to only use 4 to 6 cores, and rarely to 100% utilization. BVH construction, updating, and traversal can be handled by a general purpose GPU. 
but it can also scale over multiple GPUs, as can the shading. In this one example we see a 3.55x speed up over 4 GPUs. 88% scaling up to 4 GPUs is excellent, you'd be glad to see that in basic AFR SLI with just 2 GPUs. With 2 GPUs, the scaling here is a close to perfect 97%. I've talked at length why multi-GPU is the future and it's not just because DX12 and Vulkan make SLI so much better than in the past, it's because ray tracing loves parallelism. In July we got a look at an AMD patent on ray tracing which was quite telling. They discussed fixed function units which can be used for accelerating a BVH node, but instead of dedicated BVH cache they suggest using the existing texture cache. Tech Power Up says this about it. The idea is that the fixed function ray tracing hardware can now use the texture system's already existing memory buffers instead of having to store ray tracing specific data locally which adds to die area and chip complexity. The patent focuses on reuse of hardware to keep chip complexity low, but it also has the benefit in terms of flexibility of programming and higher occupancy, not having parts of your GPU go idle depending on the workload. Nvidia's Turing is a large chip. A good portion is taken up with tensor cores plus the hardware for RT. Tensor cores are indeed great for denoising, but there are other options. Intel released the open source machine learning system for this task, and there are other GP GPU solutions as well. And NVIDIA's approach to RT in Turing has limitations, which they outline in their documentation. When using RT, we should not include the skybox. Geometry should be opaque as alpha testing incurs a big performance penalty. Shaders should be as simple as possible. It's why shadows are the cheapest form of RT and reflections more taxing. We have to keep the ray payload small. Payload size translates to a register count, so this directly affects occupancy. Large payloads will spill over into memory. We have to limit the use of any hit shaders. There are three types of shaders, any hit, closest or miss. Closest hit executes when the ray hits the point closest to the starting point of the ray. Miss means it executes if the ray hits nothing. Any will execute at each potential intersection, making them very expensive. Some people said Turing is a future-proof chip because of its forward-looking feature set, but a year later and it's hard to call RTX much of a success. What people call hardware ray tracing is mostly just a block of memory a cache for geometry, buffering against slow GDDR accesses. This just seems too rigid to be truly future-proof. NVIDIA is struggling to find uses for their special cores, and this is always a problem with fixed function units in variable workloads. Had they instead opted for a general approach to denoising, something that ran on compute shaders, then if you were not using them for denoising anything, you'd have that hardware available for other uses. The same goes for RT cores and the BVH cache memory. The more specific the use case for a set of hardware, the more difficult it is to keep it active in variable workloads. When it comes to their RT implementation, there are a lot of limits, not least of which is your memory size, which puts a hard limit on how much geometry you can actually accelerate. RT performance likely won't ever increase. Much of the die is idle much of the time, tensor cores and the RT cache when RT is not operational. DLSS will probably die off in its current form. And by the time DirectX and any titles support mesh shading, a whole new generation of GPUs will have been released. Next year we get NVIDIA's second generation of RT-capable GPUs. NVIDIA will have learnt from Turing and improved upon these limitations. It will also be built on a more advanced process. We also know AMD is prepping RT-capable cards too. We've seen the latent patents, both Sony and Microsoft have said their console will support the technology. AMD has typically performed quite well in the area of compute performance, something integral to ray tracing calculations, but they've also had a problem with occupancy. It's been hard to get all their shaders up and running in unison, so in gaming workloads they have not looked as efficient. This has been particularly evident in Vega. RDNA has addressed this. Navi is getting around 30% more FPS per shader than Vega and is on par with Nvidia. Nvidia will have had a form of RT in the market for over a year, so we might argue they've got the advantage on the software side. AMD will have had multiple 7 nanometer chips in the market for over a year, so could have the hardware advantage. AMD could also face supply shortfalls, considering the demand for their 7 nanometer CPUs, desktop and server, have rocketed. How all that plays out is anybody's guess. With AMD's recent catch up in the GPU space, Nvidia soon to catch up in the manufacturing process, it'll be a good fight. How manufacture and supply pans out involves too many variables to predict. What is a safer bet is come 2021, every game developer on the planet wanting to add ray tracing will be optimizing for AMD's implementation of ray tracing, because that's what's in the next generation consoles. And those optimizations will transfer almost seamlessly to AMD's discrete GPUs using desktop PCs. Nvidia tried to get ahead of it and force the world to use RTX. 
and they may have been able to do that had more software performed better but in the end the number of titles where RTX impresses is fractionally small. Outside of consoles and PCs there is someone else who also buys AMD GPUs. Google. Google's streaming platform Stadia will want to match at least the graphical fidelity of its console rivals if not offering options exceeding it. Would they go for Nvidia GPUs or would they use the supplier they already have and the same company who makes the RT tech for millions of consoles, which would make it much easier for developers to port their code onto Stadia? The servers Google is using for Stadia contain an unknown number of GPUs, but we do know instances will be able to access at least two, because we've seen that in a demo. There's no reason why future high-end instances couldn't access four GPUs, each with optimizations for ray tracing. Okay, time to use your imagination. Think of a AAA title with advanced graphics. Think about how incredible that looks on a console with four teraflops of performance and no special optimizations for ray tracing. Okay, now imagine what that might look like if it was ray traced and scaled over four GPUs with a total of 40 teraflops of performance. 40 teraflops of performance is what Unreal Engine creator Tim Sweeney said would be the base level for photorealism. And we can take a guess at when a developer might be in a position to bring something like this to the market. We're going to need API extensions. DXR 1.1 is coming next year. The Vulkan API is continually being updated. This will be an iterative process over the next couple of years. From 2020, GPUs with necessary optimizations, faster cache, faster memory, are also a given. How long it takes them to reach market saturation, however, is a bigger question. It took the PS4 four years to overtake the install base of the PS3, so maybe we can use that as a rough time frame. PCIe 5 and 6, CXL, CCIX and GMI or Infinity Fabric are going to bring much faster lower latency communications between devices. But we don't really care about bandwidth as much as latency though, and that's where the Compute Express link, CXL, comes in. CXL goes hand in hand with PCIe 5 using its physical layer but implementing a new set of protocols on top. It enables direct device device access and lower latency. Faster memory will be coming. DDR5 on PC and HBM2E, HBM3 on GPUs. And then possibly one of the slowest things is game engine support. A lot of the game engines wait until hardware is very mainstream before they end up supporting it. Having the hardware in consoles and shipping in discrete GPUs addresses that to some level. But game streaming has the potential to be a huge driver of ray tracing and other high-end features. High-end PC gaming requires people actually buy high-end PCs. Streaming makes this barrier go away. The barrier to entry changes from thousands of dollars in a power-hungry box, which you then also have to maintain, to just paying a slightly higher subscription. The incentive today is for developers to target the lowest specs possible. With streaming, the incentive flips somewhat. They want to entice people into higher service tiers. If you make a game with truly next generation graphics, you don't have to dumb it down so it runs on the majority of systems. You can just release it on Stadia and not a single potential customer has to upgrade their PC to play it. There are over 1 billion PC gamers in the world and with Stadia, the install base conundrum vanishes. Every single one of them could potentially be a customer for a multi-GPU fully ray traced game without any consumers having to open a PC case to replace a part. The ray tracing revolution will truly begin in late 2020 and should find footing in the mainstream over the next. Turing will certainly take a place in history but more because of the ideas it raised than the architecture. A year from now and it will most likely struggle to keep up. Whereas the GTX 1080 Ti turned out to be future proof because of its sheer performance, the very specific features of Turing and a design which bakes in limitations probably won't seem as attractive to developers or users when competition lands. Even competition from Nvidia.